Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. Alright, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today, Iran launches missile strikes in Iraq and Syria. So Iran said on Monday night that its forces launched ballistic missile strikes in Iraq and Syria that targeted spy headquarters in the gathering of anti-Iranian terrorist groups. And this comes as regional tensions continue to soar. So Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, said the strikes in Syria targeted ISIS members who were involved in the recent bombing in Kerman, Iran, which killed 94 people. So that was the attack that targeted a commemoration ceremony for Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general head of the Quds Force who was killed by the U.S. back in 2020. And ISIS took responsibility for that, so they said that they hit some some ISIS members in Syria. I'm not sure exactly where the strikes were, uh, but the ones in Iraq seem to be more substantial. Uh, They are claiming that they targeted espionage headquarters of Israel's Mossad spy agency. And this was in Iraqi Kurdistan's capital of Erbil in the the northern part of Iraq. Multiple missile strikes were reported in Erbil near the U.S. consulate. But there's no indication right now that the facility was hit. When this story first broke, there was stuff all over Twitter that the U.S. consulate was, was hit by Iran. You know, that makes it seem... That definitely worried people and myself because if Iran and the U.S. you know directly attack each other, that could mean a big, big war. Uh, but a U.S. official told ABC News, "quote No U.S. facilities were impacted. We are not tracking damage to infrastructure or injuries at this time." End quote. So Iran did not specify why it targeted the alleged Mossad headquarters. But the strikes come about a month and a half after Israel killed a senior IRGC official in Syria. Basically, as far as I understand it, it was the IRGC's head, basically head officer in Syria. Um, So that was a big deal that Israel killed him. And Iran has previously targeted the area in response to an Israeli attack. And Israeli assets and, and operatives are known to be in in Iraqi Kurdistan back in March 2022 so this happened very similar strikes happened back then it was very close to the U.S. consulate in Erbil and Iran launched these strikes after an Israeli attack on a drone facility inside Iran that Israel has a history of covert operations inside Iran they usually don't officially take credit for the attacks and that was the same with this one so this attack was actually in february 2022 the israeli attack and then the next month iran bombed these sites in herbal and actually just recently naftali bennett the former israeli prime minister he recently wrote an op-ed in the wall street journal basically calling for the u.s to to go to war with iran you know on behalf of israel and in that article he strongly he basically said strongly hinted that Israel was responsible for this attack. So anyway, this is an interesting piece of information that I found thanks to uh, Kyle Anzalone. So again, March 2022, Iran bombs Erbil. They say that they struck a Mossad base, basically. And at the time, a senior U.S. official told the New York Times that the building Iran targeted did serve as an Israeli intelligence outpost and training facility. The official and another U.S. official said that Israel is known to have conducted intelligence operations against Iran from Kurdistan. So uh, it's not an outlandish claim from Iran that they were targeting, you know, Mossad assets. Uh, At the same time, you have the Kurdish regional government, which oversees Iraqi Kurdistan. They denied that there are any sort of Israeli bases in the region. And according to Rudal, which is based in Iraqi Kurdistan, it's a Kurdish media outlet, they said that Iran's attacks on Erbil killed at least four civilians and wounded 17. And I saw since I wrote this, the U.S. came out and strongly condemned the Iranian missile strikes, calling them reckless or something, even though, you know, the U.S. just recently 
conducted a few rounds of airstrikes in Iraq against the will of the Iraqi government. All right, so the next one here, more regional escalation. Houthi missile hits a U.S.-owned cargo ship in the Gulf of Aden. So U.S. Central Command said Monday that a Houthi anti-ship ballistic missile hit a U.S.-owned cargo ship. And this is another escalation that comes a few days after the U.S. and Britain bombed dozens of Houthi targets in Yemen. The missile struck the Gibraltar Eagle, a Marshall Islands-flagged ship, that's owned by the U.S.-based Eagle Bulk Shipping, and the ship was struck while it was transiting the Gulf of Aden. And CENTCOM said that there was no casualties or damage reported in this attack. Eagle Bulk, the shipping company, said that there was limited damage, but that the ship was able to leave the area. The company said, quote, As a result of the impact, the vessel suffered limited damage to a cargo hold but is stable and is heading out of the area, end quote. So the Houthis later took responsibility for the attack. Houthi military spokesman Yahya Saria said, quote, The naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces carried out a military operation targeting an American ship in the Gulf of Aden with several appropriate naval missiles resulting in precise and direct hits, end quote. So before Monday, the Houthis had not targeted U.S. commercial shipping and said that their attacks were limited to Israeli-linked vessels. But that changed after the U.S. and the U.K. escalated the situation by bombing Yemen on Friday. After the strikes, a Houthi spokesman said that all British and American interests had become targets. So here you go. The re- this is the result of the U.S. bombing Yemen. Is uh, the-, the Houthis now are, gonna- are targeting American cargo ships, American commercial shipping. So the Houthis, officially known as Ansar Allah, have made clear that their attacks on Israel-linked shipping would not stop until the Israeli onslaught in Gaza ends. And instead of pressuring Israel to end the slaughter, President Biden opted for regional escalation. U.S. officials have acknowledged that the bombing did not harm the Houthis' ability to launch offensive attacks. And there was other missiles launched in the area, either in the Red Sea or down in the Gulf of Aden. Um... So the, they're they're keeping up these attacks. The U.S. claims somehow that even though they bombed Yemen, they 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 don't want escalation, which is just nonsense. Uh, but they they say that they have launched these attacks, you know, for deterrence. That's what they always say. But they're not deterring anything. They're just escalating uh, the situation. Um, and again, I mentioned in this in this story just because it's really amazing to me just how the fact that Saudi Arabia, you know, the U.S.'s former partner against the Houthis in a brutal, brutal war is urging restraint. So hopefully that means that the, the, the truce between the Saudi coalition and the Houthis is, is not shattered because of these U.S. airstrikes. So far, I haven't seen any indication that the Houthis are going to hit Saudi Arabia. There were some reports that the U.S., planes that bombed Yemen might have gone through Saudi airspace and the Houthis said anybody that opened the airspace would become a target but we haven't seen anything that indicates the Houthis are thinking about going after Saudi Arabia all right so the next one here the New Jersey National Guard to deploy to Iraq and Syria so the New Jersey National Guard is preparing to deploy 1500 troops to Iraq and Syria amid a spate of attacks on U.S. bases in the two countries that started in mid-October over Biden's support for Israel. It's unclear if this deployment is part of a scheduled troop rotation or if they are being sent to reinforce the U.S. military presence in the region. I haven't seen anything. To me, I'm guessing this is a, a regular troop rotation and that they're not. I just haven't heard anything about the U.S. sending additional forces to Iraq and Syria. This was reported by CBS News. They just had this little short report speaking with some of these National Guard soldiers who were deploying. Didn't mention anything about all these attacks in Iraq and Syria. You know, it's pretty unbelievable that that context was left out of the report. Um, according, so according to the Pentagon, U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria have come under at least 130 drone, rocket, and mortar attacks since October 17th. And the attacks have injured 69 American soldiers. An umbrella group of Shia militias that calls itself the Islamic resistance of Iraq has taken credit 
for most of the attacks, and we've seen the U.S. launch airstrikes in response in eastern Syria and Iraq, and the Iraqi government is very unhappy and calling for an end to the U.S. presence. So they were actually asked about this report, and the Iraqi government denied that the U.S. was sending reinforcements. And Tassin al Kafali, who's a spokesman for the Iraqi Operations Command, says that Iraq does not need any foreign troops. That was his response when asked about this report. So the U.S. leads an international coalition in Iraq known as Operation Inherent Resolve that helps fight ISIS. Although these days it's clear that the U.S. presence is about countering Iran and they don't want to give up. They just don't want to give up the bases there in general. The U.S. military is still involved in anti-ISIS operations in Iraq. I, I linked to a report there from U.S. Central Command. They put out these monthly reports on their operations against ISIS. And this this one was this was the last one that, that I saw they posted. This was for the month of November, which said U.S. Central Command, along with coalition and other forces, conducted a total of 40 uh, ISIS operations, resulting in four ISIS operatives killed and 33 detained. And that was in both Iraq and Syria. In Iraq, there was 24 partnered operations. Usually the U.S. forces aren't directly involved in those these days, at least. Uh, that's mostly the Iraqi government forces with U.S. support. Um, but I was, talking to, uh, I was talking to Scott Horton about this today, and we were talking about how a lot of people probably don't realize that the U.S. has been involved in military operations against ISIS uh, still in Iraq and Syria. Um, I, last year in 2020, what year is it? In like the beginning of 2023, end of 2022, there was actually a lot of U.S. drone strikes in Syria against ISIS, a lot of raids targeting what they call ISIS leaders. Um, but anyway, Iraq says that they could handle these ISIS remnants because that's all they are. They don't control any significant territory. And then over in Syria, you know, you got the Syrian government, uh, their allies, the, the Kurds that the U.S. backs. If the U.S. pulls out, they'll all fight against ISIS. It's not like there's a chance of the, the caliphate uh, being you know brought back or anything. If anything, ISIS is benefiting from the Shia militias firing at the U.S. because you know th those are ISIS's enemies as well. They're benefiting from kind of this chaos. Um, so anyway, again, I mentioned just that this CBS News report did not just didn't mention any of the context. Just portrayed it as a deployment against ISIS when really they're just going over there to be sitting ducks and potentially be killed for Israel. And it's ridiculous that it's the National Guard being deployed. This is the New Jersey National Guard's largest overseas deployment since 2008. Um, the people that defend the Guard, bring our troops home, they work, they're working to pass local legislation in states that would prohibit the deployment of a state's National Guard to a combat zone if Congress has not formally declared war. It just passed the New Hampshire House, uh, which was a big deal. Um, so if you want to get involved in that, it's really good activism to, you know, get involved in and spend your time on, I think. You can go to Bring Our Troops Home, that U.S., or you can go to Defend the Guard, I believe, dot U.S., or just, just Google it. Uh, all right, so the next one here, Israeli Defense Minister says the intensive phase in North Gaza is over. So Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said Monday that the intensive phase of the Israeli ground offensive in North Gaza has ended and that it would soon end in the south as well. He said, quote, in the northern part of the strip, this phase has ended. In southern Gaza, we will reach this achievement and the intensive phase will end soon, end quote. So he did not give any sort of indication of a timeline for when Israel will reduce its operations in southern Gaza, which is where most Palestinians are located now. Um, when Secretary of State Antony Blinken was recently in Israel, Gallant actually told him that Israel would be intensifying operations in the southern city of Khan Yunus, and they really did ramp up airstrikes and everything. And the U.S. has been asking Israel to reduce the intensity of its onslaught in Gaza and switch to more targeted operations. But the U.S. hasn't put any real pressure on Israel, continues to provide the aid. That's why I said they've been asking them to do it. They're not telling them to do it or, or let, they're just not using any leverage whatsoever. Uh, one U.S. official actually told the Washington Post that there was no point in the U.S. asking Israel to change its tactics before February. 
the, this, the report, I just want to read the line from this report because it's really something. Uh, it says, quote, one senior U.S. official said it is pointless to urge them to change and that Washington's priority now shifted to tolerating Israel's high intensity operation throughout January while insisting instead that it downgrade the tempo in February, end quote. So just shrugging their shoulders. And, you know, the way that they word this says that they're tolerating Israel's high intensity operation. They're not just tolerating it. They're supporting it. They're fueling it and funding it. They act like there's some innocent bystander in this. Um, so Gallant said on Monday that Israel would, quote, adopt our operations on the ground in accordance with the reality on the ground as it becomes clear to us in accordance with military achievements, with the destruction of the enemy, and in accordance with our intelligence, end quote. He claimed that in North Gaza, Israel had dismantled Hamas battalion frameworks and that Israeli forces were focusing on eliminating pockets of resistance. And he said they'll achieve that via raids, airstrikes, special operations, and additional activities. So still lots of airstrikes happening in the north, it seems like. Israeli ground troops have faced stiff resistance from Hamas and other militant groups in Gaza. The Israeli military has so far confirmed 188 of its troops have been killed fighting on the ground in Gaza. But there are Israeli media reports that indicate the casualty, the, the death toll could be higher. They're saying that there's at least 4,000 Israeli troops that have been disabled, which uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty big number. Um, all right, so the next one here, the CIA is providing Israel with intelligence on top Hamas officials. So this article is from Kyle at the Libertarian Institute. Um, and he goes over that report I covered yesterday from The Intercept about the intelligence, the, the U.S. Air Force deploying uh, intelligence officers to... Israel, but also there was a New York Times report that said in the days following the Hamas attack on southern Israel, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan ordered the creation of a CIA task force to collect intelligence on Hamas. The U.S. stepped up drone flights to collect more communications between Hamas members, and they say they're they're helping with, uh, you know, surveillance to locate hostages. So it's just more of an indication that you know if they're collecting intelligence on Hamas. That means they could be providing Israel with targeting data. All right, so the next one here, Israel ignored warnings about Hamas preparing for the October 7th attack. So this is an article from BBC, and it's about these young Israeli women in the IDF whose jobs, and there was a similar report in Haaretz about this, but it was basically their job to sit on surveillance bases near the Gaza border for hours and look for signs of anything suspicious. In the months leading up to the October 7th attack by Hamas, they did begin to see things, practice raids, mock hostage taking, and farmers behaving strangely on the other side of the fence. Um, and basically, this is a pretty long report, but the gist of it is that these women said they were seeing things and they would, a they would actually joke with each other about who would be on duty when the attack happened, when the inevitable attack happened. That's, you know, how, what their attitude was about it because they saw this stuff, it seems like almost every day and they were telling their superiors, but nobody listened to them and some of them were actually killed um, by Hamas during the attack. So uh, it's just more evidence of the, the Israelis um, ignoring you know, there's just so many signs that they had. This mentions the New York Times report that said they actually had Hamas's attack plan over a year before it happened. And there's the Shin Bet had sources in Gaza telling them that something was coming. Egypt warned Israel that something was coming. Lots and lots of indications, yet it happened anyway. Um, all right, so the next one here, President Biden ignores Palestinian deaths in Gaza statement. So President Biden released a statement on Sunday marking 100 days since the October 7th Hamas attack on southern Israel and the launching of Israel's brutal campaign in Gaza, and his statement made no mention of the nearly 24,000 Palestinians that have been killed. The statement instead focused on the remaining Israeli hostages in Gaza. It said, quote, Today we mark a devastating and tragic milestone. 100 days of captivity for the more than 100 innocent people, including as many as six Americans who are still being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza, end quote. 
as far as I know, most of the hostages that they have are members of the IDF that they have remaining. Maybe not most of them, but I know that they haven't handed over any of the, the, the military personnel that they took in. Biden said that he has been working nonstop to secure the freedom of the Israeli hostages, and his support for Israel's campaign has involved political support, unconditional military aid, including the shipment of bombs, artillery shells, and tank ammunition. The statement concluded, quote, no one should have to endure even one day of what they have gone through, much less 100. On this terrible day, I again reaffirm my pledge to all the hostages and their families. We are with you. We will never stop working to bring Americans home, end quote. So saying nobody should have to endure what these 100 Israeli hostages are dealing with. This is so horrific. While 24,000 Palestinians have been killed, including over 9,600 children, and so many more are display like just the situation that these people are dealing with. And there are American citizens, American Palestinian citizens. Some of them have gotten out, but not all of them. I and mean, you just never hear the U.S. talk about them. They don't matter. Right? Palestinians just don't matter to them. And uh, Biden, Blinken released a similar statement, made no mention of the Palestinians, and they've come under some pretty sharp criticism. So Akbar Shahid Ahmed, who's a reporter for HuffPost, and he's had a lot of these scoops about the internal dissent within the State Department and other uh, government agencies. He said a State Department official told him, quote, it's harder day by day to justify working for this cruel and almost bloodthirsty administration, end quote. So again, more of that internal dissent. All right, so the next one here, British Defense Secretary says that Britain is in a pre-war phase. So this article is from Jason Ditz. As top British officials defend the decision to join the U.S. in attacks on Yemen, British Defense Secretary Grant Shapps has informed Parliament of potential wars in the years to come with several major nations, including Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. So he's hitting most of them. And he described the situation as a pre-war phase and cautioned that wars with one or more of these nations could break out within the next five years. Britain would, of course, be directly involved, and they would follow anything that the U.S. does, probably. You know, they'd go right along with the U.S. And the U.K.'s military, I mean, they're the ones, for a while now, we've been seeing that them say British officials, Ukrainian officials say that the UK has like depleted all of its weapons by, by arming Ukraine. They, they couldn't really afford to send all the stuff that they did. Um, they're struggling to recruit people. They couldn't deploy a warship to the Red Sea because they didn't have enough uh, personnel to staff to, to crew the thing. Um, so the fact that they're so hawkish, is it just, uh, I don't really get it. Um, and, you know, Sunak, the British prime minister, he's defending his decision to, to join the U.S. in these airstrikes, even as the thing, things are just escalating even more. Um, but, you know, they're just gung-ho. They just say, okay, U.S., whatever you want us to do, we're, we're right behind you. Um, all right, so the next one here, unofficial U.S. delegation visits Taiwan after election. So this article is from the South China Morning Post. And it says a delegation from the United States has arrived in Taiwan in a show of America's continued support for Taipei two days after the self-ruled island elected a new president. The delegation, led by former National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley and former Deputy Secretary of State James Steinberg, landed on the island on Sunday amid warnings from Beijing that the election of William Lai ching Te would increase the risk of conflict. Observers said that aside from showing support for the new administration, which takes office in May, the trip was also an attempt to head off any plans by the Lai leadership to alter the balance of cross-strait relations. Sent by the U.S. administration of President Joe Biden, members of the group met Lai and incumbent President Tsai Ing-wen on Monday to assess post-election developments firsthand. In separate Closed-door meetings, the retired officials told Lai and Tsai that U.S.-Taiwan relations would remain on a firm footing under the new administration. Uh, Taiwan has built exceptionally strong ties with the U.S. since Tsai was elected president in 2016. 
Tsai, who has rejected Beijing's One China principle, has sought to ally with Washington to counter threats from the mainland. And her party won again. That's her vice president who won. So we're going to expect more of the same, although they, they lost the legislature, so it might be tougher for them to push new laws through. Um, but I don't know if they can really block the things that they want when it comes to the support from the U.S. It's really going to anger China, the increased military aid, military training, and kind of diplomatic things that might seem just symbolic to you or I. But for China, you know, it, it's arguably more... Uh, they get arguably arguably more angry by kind of the diplomatic stuff than the military stuff. All right, so the last one here, Lloyd Austin has been discharged from the hospital after two weeks. This article is from Politico. So after being hospitalized for two weeks due to complications from surgery to treat prostate cancer, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was released on Monday. In a statement following his release, Austin thanked the doctors and staff who cares about that? Uh, but he underwent surgery in December to treat prostate cancer. He was hospitalized in early January, and he didn't tell Biden. The White House was not informed, and they did not learn of his hospitalization until three days after he was first admitted. Austin's deputy was running the Pentagon from a beach, I believe in Puerto Rico. Didn't think, maybe I should get on a plane and fly back to Washington. No, I could just do this here from my cell phone or whatever, which is just really something. Uh, but he is working remotely for some time. He's not back at the Pentagon yet. So it's something I haven't really been thinking about this too much, but all these escalations going on, and, and the Secretary of Defense has been uh, been in the hospital. Uh, all right, so that's it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Eugene Galtz, U.S. military role in the Red Sea now turning offensive is a bad deal. And it's something about the... It's about the costs of the deployments of using these million dollar missiles, million, not million dollar, millions of dollar missiles to shoot down these very cheap Houthi drones and uh, Houthi missiles and just how the cost of deploying the military and and launching air and doing all this stuff that they're doing um, is, does not outweigh the, uh, you know, the, the considering the, the shipping, Basically, it's more expensive for the U.S. to do this response than it is the uh, fluctuations in the in the market that happened as a result of the Houthi attacks. And now the Houthis are targeting U.S. shipping. They weren't commercial shipping. They weren't doing that before. Uh, the next one here, Ted Galen Carpenter, Washington's continuing contempt for its Iraqi ally. One from Jeremy Scahill, in genocide case against Israel at The Hague, the U.S. is the unnamed co-conspirator. One from Ramsey Baroud, from Gaza to Congo on Zionism and the unlearned history of genocide. And one from Aaron Mate, Biden, Israel's accomplice in Gaza, pretends to be a bystander. So please go check all that out. I think that's what was in my head before when I said Biden acts like he's an innocent bystander when he's not. This I read this article from Aaron Mate. Um Anyway, that's it for me for today. Please support antiwar.com by sharing this show, telling your friends about us, like and subscribe on YouTube, wherever you prefer to watch. We You can also find it wherever you listen to podcasts, the audio version. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with some more news. Hopefully there's no more huge escalations. Um, but anyway, I'll talk to you then. Thanks for listening.